Okay, so now we're going to move into chapter six, uh, the learning chapter. Um, I have to be honest, it's kind of one of my favorite chapters, and I'll explain why as we go along. Um, mainly because I use a lot of this in my in my current profession you know, as a therapist, and uh, uh, you know, and I'll explain some examples of that as we go through this. Um, so we're going to start with this. And we're going to do part one tonight, um, and then part two of chapter six will be done on uh, Monday evening. Uh, so there will be two separate videos, parts one and two. So you'll be all look on the lookout for that. All right, so let's get started. Um, so when it comes to learned behavior, well, when it comes to learning, first we have to kind of differentiate between um, what is unlearned, because that's going to be really, really important to understand uh, as we move into like classical conditioning and things like that. So there are some unlearned behaviors. There's natural reflexes and instincts that um, organisms are just born with, right? And, and instincts and reflexes are designed to help organisms adapt to their, to their environment. So let's kind of break this down. So reflexes are motor or neural reactions to a specific stimulus. Um, and they're simpler than instincts, right? Um, and it involves the activity of specific body parts. And it also involves the most primitive sense, uh, centers of the central nervous system, right? So the spinal cord and the medulla. Um, so for example here, um, human babies are born with a sucking reflex. They're just born knowing how to do that, right? Um, and then instincts are behaviors that um, are triggered by a broader range of events, right? Um, that include um, aging, change of seasons. Um, instincts are more complex. Um, they involve movement of the organism as a whole, uh, such as sexual activity um, is an example of an instinct. Um, migration is an example of an instinct. Um, and instincts do involve higher brain centers. Um, so those are unlearned, unlearned behaviors. So now we kind of talked about that. Let's talk about what learning actually is. Um, Right, so the purpose of learning is, is is it helps organisms adapt to their environment, um, but learned behaviors involve change and experience. Right, so so the definition of learning that I definitely want you to know, it's highlighted in red here with with orange or with yellow, is that it is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. Right. So it involves acquiring skills and knowledge through experience. It involves conscious as well as unconscious processes. And, and we'll talk about that as well as we move through this. Um, then there's associative learning, right? And that's when an organism makes connections between events or stimuli that occur together or simultaneously or near each other in the environment, right? And so uh, associative learning includes things like classical conditioning, which we talked about briefly in the first chapter with um, when you were introduced to Ivan Pavlov. We are gonna talk about him a little bit more in depth now. Uh, and then there's operant conditioning, which you were briefly also introduced to when we talked about behaviorism and Skinner in the first chapter. We're gonna uh, talk a little bit more in detail about that. And then we're going to uh, talk about observational learning. And I believe in a previous lecture, I kind of briefly mentioned um, Bandura uh, and the Bobo doll experiment. There's, that's an example of observational learning. So these are the things that, that we're gonna be talking about. So when you hear associative learning, I want you to think about these types of um, learning processes, classical conditioning, operant conditioning and observational learning. 
first let's talk about Ivan Pavlov. Um, I'm actually, I've already posted these videos in the modules, uh, chapter six module, um, because I really kind of want to get through the lecture. And I do want you to watch these on your own, because um, I think it will help, under, help you understand. Um, but when it comes to classical conditioning, there's lots of terms that I'm going to be talking about. And I just kind of want to have some time to explain them and make sure I have enough time to answer questions so that that you guys um, uh, are kind of getting getting the information that I want you to get. Um, so if you recall, Ivan Pavlov was a Russian scientist. He was actually not studying psychology. He was studying digestive um, systems in, in dogs. He was studying digestion, right? One of the processes, the, the, the first process in digestion is salivation. And why I'm bringing that up now is um, because that's how he stumbled upon um, classical conditioning quite by accident. So what classical conditioning is, is it's a process by which we learn to associate certain stimuli and consequently be able to anticipate events. So when this, when this stimulus or this thing happens, I know something else is going to follow, right? Um, so one day he's walking into his lab, Dr. Pavlov, and um, he noticed that the dogs started salivating, um, but without the presence of food, right? Which caught his attention because that is not, um, was not expected. So if we go back to unlearned things, right? You don't have to teach someone to salivate in the presence of food or while they're eating. It's just a natural process that's known as unconditioned, right? It's unlearned. Um, but for whatever reason, the dogs were salivating because that salivation had become conditioned, connected to somehow Dr. Pavlov entering the lab. So does that make sense? Um, so I always make the joke, you know, what rings your bell? What triggers you? Um, and when I, when I make that joke um, or when I ask that question, I'm really asking you about what are your conditioned or learned responses and associations that you've developed in your life, right? So what I'm going to move into next is basically how classical conditioning occurs and why it's important for learning. So in classical conditioning, learning can occur when a conditioned stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So um, the unconditioned stimulus would be something that is natural, that elicits a natural reflex, in this case, salivation. So, before conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus um, that I just mentioned would be the salivation. And then the unconditioned response, uh, I'm sorry, let me slow down because I misspoke and I don't want to confuse anybody. The unconditioned stimulus is the food. So I apologize, I misspoke. So the unconditioned stimulus is the food. The unconditioned response is the salivation, right? So you have food and it causes salivation. You don't have to learn anything about that. It just happens, right? However, during conditioning, a neutral stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So in this case, um, a bell is rung at the same time that food is presented. Now, initially in the beginning, just presenting the food, even with the bell, um, you're gonna have salivation. But after a while of repeatedly doing this, right? So ring the bell, present the food. 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 And salivation is occurring each time this happens. After conditioning, once that happens enough times, 
just ringing the bell triggers the salivation. And I'm using the word trigger purposely. So as many of you know, that I, my, main, my main job is, is uh, as a therapist, I work with individuals that have substance use disorders. And there is a lot of classical conditioning that occurs with substance use disorders. Um, so when we're working with clients, we're often trying to figure out what their triggers are. What is it that is a stimulus to have them want to go use or experience craving to use the drug of their choice, right? And it's usually something that's been paired with their using. And I'll have some examples as we, as we move on. But this is why it's important. It's the same thing in, in, in any behavior change that you're trying to do. Um, let's say you're trying to manage your weight or you want to eat healthier. What is it that triggers you to want to eat that chocolate, right? That kind of takes you from that goal, right? So um, think about that. It's like, what is ringing my bell? Um, so I'm going to stop here for just a second, leave this screen on here and make sure that we don't have any questions. And please do not be shy. This is, this could be very confusing initially. And when you're being tested on it, if you're not reading carefully enough, unconditioned and conditioned can get mixed up, kind of like physiological versus psychological or antagonist versus agonist, right? Um, this is one of those situations where you kind of really, kind of really need to focus and understand the differences so that you can understand the concept questions. So I will shut up and give someone time to ask a question or type in the chat. All right, not seeing or hearing anything. I'm gonna to continue to move on. Uh, I will probably beat this like a dead horse. So uh, forgive me. Um, here is a visual representation of what I was talking about. Um, so here you have the dog being presented food and what happens? So the dog salivates, that's the unconditioned response in response to the food, which is the unconditioned stimulus. So remember, whenever you see the word unconditioned, I want you to think unlearned, right? So the dog salivates at the, present, uh, at the presentation of food. No learning there, it just happens. What happens if you ring a bell for a dog? Nothing. The bell doesn't really mean anything uh, as far as food goes. He's not gonna salivate in response, to the, uh, in response to the bell. He might react to the bell because he hears it. It's a stimulus in the environment, but it's not gonna cause him to salivate. In the next set of pictures, now we're pairing the bell with the food. So the bell, which up here is a neutral stimulus, that's what the NS stands for. Um, hold on one second, I'm gonna turn on my laser pointer. Right, so that's what NS stands for. It's a neutral stim stimulus. Um, it doesn't mean anything about food for the dog. During conditioning, this is when you begin to pair the bell with the food. So the bell, the neutral stimulus, gets paired with the unconditioned stimulus, the food. So bell, food, bell, food, bell, food. Once that pairing exists, when the dog hears the bell, he now anticipates he's learned that he's going to get food, right? Or he, he learned that he can anticipate getting food. So what happens, he begins to salivate. So now the bell is no longer a neutral stimulus. The bell is now a conditioned stimulus. In other words, it's a, con a learned stimulus, which causes a conditioned um, response. This is a typo. This should be CR here, sorry, I just now caught that. Um, so the conditioned stimulus causes this conditioned response, which is the learned behavior, right? And there's a couple of fun videos that, that I want you guys to watch. If we have time on 
on Monday, I may play them, but I want to make sure that I have enough time to get through uh, through this material. And it appears that a question has come in through the chat. I will address that. Let's see. Okay, so here's the question. Uh, the individual read, writes, you mentioned triggers. It's like a smoker trying to quit who hasn't smoked for two or three weeks and then walks into a bar where he does the most smoking while drinking uh, with buddies and automatically places a cigarette in his between his lips. Yes, that's absolutely correct, right? So if, um, if this individual is trying to stop smoking, and I'm gonna talk about trigger extinction in a little bit, there is a way to do that, right? Where you begin to break that association, but that's exactly it. Uh, going into the bar, bar, it might be a trigger for a strong desire to smoke. Um, seeing his buddies outside the bar might be a might trigger a strong desire to smoke, even though they're not in the same environment. So um, these learned associations can be very simple, such as the bell and the food, or they can be more complex, uh, which we're going to address here in just a just a minute or two, actually. Any other questions on unconditioned response, unconditioned stimulus, neutral stimulus, conditioned response, and conditioned stimulus? Lots of terms that look very similar. All right. So this is where I was talking about higher order and second order conditioning, right? This is where it can become a little bit more complex. Um, so here in the example, higher order uh, conditioning is an established condition stimulus is paired with a new neutral stimulus, right? So uh, in the first, let me turn on my laser pointer here. So in the graphic here, let's just look at this. So in the graphic, we have the neutral stimulus originally just being a, a can opener, but it becomes a conditioned stimulus because then the cat learns that when I hear this sound, I know I'm getting food. Anybody here that has a cat or even a dog, um, you know, the wrinkling of the bag and the dog comes running, um, for example, because they've learned that that sound, right, means they're gonna get a treat or they're gonna get food. So the can opener linked with the food, the, the, uh, the cat responds to it. Now, let's say your food is in the squeaky cabinet. <laughs> so then there's the squeaky cabinet, the sound of the can opener being presented just before the food and the cat responds to that. And then pretty soon, even if the squeaky door opens and there's no can opener or food, the cat may still respond, right? So that just, that shows how it can be um, a little bit more complex. So it's kind of like going back to that smoking example that one of the students just presented, right? Um, going into the bar may be a trigger to smoke. Going into the bar, seeing his friends um, may be a trigger to smoke. Outside the bar, just seeing a particular friends or friends from the bar may be a trigger to smoke. So it's, it's about recognizing where these triggers are coming from. And with, when I'm working with individuals with substance use disorders, um, sometimes that can take some teasing out, um, especially with these higher order and second order conditioning. All right, let's see. It looks like we have a question coming in. Before I can respond to it, I have to turn off my laser pointer because my mouse doesn't work right when it's on. All right. Yes, exactly. Um, so the student said, yep, my, my cat does that with the can opener. Yeah, if you want to really have fun with your cat, add another neutral stimulus to it and see what happens in a couple of weeks. I'm just kidding. Don't torture your cat. <laughs> and this stuff happens without... Is, is, like we're not even trying to condition our pets, but they learn, right? They learn. 
All right. Uh, all right. We're going to talk about acquisition and extinction here in a second, but I want to make sure does anybody have any questions on this? All right. On Monday, we may do, if we have time, we may do a group exercise where you guys will determine, based on a presentation that I give you, um, what it is. Because I really want to make sure that you understand this before, you know, going into the exam. I want to I want to set you up for success here. All right. So in classical conditioning, there's also um, some phases that can happen here, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is the acquisition phase. And that's the initial period of learning when the organism learns to connect the neutral stimulus to the unconditioned stimulus. So um, I'm going to back up here for a second. So this, during conditioning, if you're looking at the, uh, let me put on my laser pointer, if you're looking at this picture, this is a demonstration of acquisition. So what's happening is, is the neutral stimulus is being paired with the um, unconditioned stimulus, right? Um, the, this is what's happening with, I mean, uh, with acquisition. Uh, so I kind of wanted to show that, that visual uh, idea of it. So that's the initial period of learning. Um, this usually requires a very short uh, time interval between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. And the pairing has to be repeated multiple times. And so when we talk about a short interval of time, it can happen simultaneously. It can happen immediately before, right? Um, but I can't ring my bell and then 10 minutes later, go get the food. That, that's, that's probably too long of a time interval. So uh, it, it, it's simultaneous to or, or, or immediately connected to it somehow, right? Um, Oh, well, actually, I just lied. Um, I forgot about taste aversion. Um, taste aversion is one of those um, intervals that can be, can be several hours. Um, but I was thinking specifically of the dog. So, and then there's extinction. And extinction is important because uh, one thing I always tell my clients when it comes to triggers, I always tell them triggers are learned you learned triggers and anything that can be learned can be unlearned. And that is the good news with trigger extinction. And what I always tell my clients um, is that uh, recovery from substance use disorders, right? In other words, remaining abstinent, never going back to your drug of choice is, is not just about being abstinent. Recovery is not about being abstinent. Recovery for me, as I explain it to, uh, to my clients, is freedom from triggers. Um, because part of extinction is there's phases for extinction in order to happen. But what extinction is, is it's a decrease in the conditioned response. When the um, unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the conditioned stimulus, um, so in other words, if the food stops being presented with the sound of the bell, eventually the dog will stop responding to the bell, right? And it's the same thing with trigger extinction with human beings is that when you begin to break the association, let's go to, let's go back to that smoking example that one of your, um, uh, students <coughs> presented. So if I was trying to help an individual stop smoking and the bar was a trigger for that person, I might say to that person um, in the initial phases, well, maybe you just need to avoid the bar for a little while, right? So in, in phases of trigger extinction, there's avoidance and then there's gradual reintroduction of whatever the stimulus environment might be that was triggering. 
And I say gradual, but safe reintroduction. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and then once that happens enough time where the old behavior is no longer engaged, then it, then it becomes extinct. The trigger becomes extinct. So just going to the bar would not necessarily incite a craving to smoke cigarettes, right? Um, so I hope what I just said makes sense. So I'll give you another example of trigger extinction. Uh, well, of conditioned classical conditioning and then trigger extinction. So let's say I have an individual who has an alcohol use disorder and he, he's in treatment for alcohol use disorder, wants to remain abstinent and not drink alcohol anymore. But he also likes to go fishing and he likes his friend Jim, right? And the problem is, is that going fishing is a trigger to drink and being with Jim while fishing is a trigger to drink. So in the beginning, we might have to say, okay, um, let's not go fishing for a little bit and we're gonna gradually and safely reintroduce fishing into your life again, right? And so what that might look like is that um, he goes fishing with Jim, explains to Jim that he's in recovery, or maybe he takes a, a recovery buddy with him and no one brings alcohol. So he goes fishing, he may experience triggers. He might think, you know what, I really want a beer right now, right? But he's out there, he's fishing and he's not drinking. And he repeats this behavior. Go fishing, don't drink. Go fishing, don't drink. Go fishing, go don't drink. And eventually, the learned um, classical conditioning of fishing and drinking is broken. So now he can go fishing and not experience craving to drink. So that, that's, that would be trigger extinction in that case. The other thing is, is just seeing Jim may be a trigger to drink, even if they're not fishing. So safely hang out with Jim, don't drink. Safely hang out with Jim, don't drink. And after a while of doing that, then the, then the trigger becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and extinction uh, occurs. Um, anyone here want to take a guess? Because we'll talk about this for just a few minutes. Anyone here want to take a guess why I might want to engage in some trigger extinction activities with my clients. I mean, if you can just avoid triggers, why not just avoid them, right? So why, why might I actually take the time to try to help my clients develop trigger extinction? Safely. I wanna stress safely. Maybe because you want them to feel like they can go back to their life, you know, not feel like they're cut off from everything that they used to do, um, give them alternatives. Exactly, that's exactly it right? Because if, if a person comes in and they think, oh, I can never go fishing again, or oh, what happens if I'm at Vaughn's and I walk down the wrong aisle, right? Um, I can never go to a concert again, right? Um, recovery, in my mind, should not be limiting. Um, and so there are going to be safe ways to reintroduce those things. And so that was a perfect explanation. Very good. Thank you. Um, now, there's a some, there are some things we're not going to um, try to extinct. I'm not going to send Jim to the crack house to see if he can, you know, go to a crack house and not smoke crack, right? So there are just some things that we're not going to do. Um, but regular life things, going to weddings, going to concerts, um, going to family get-togethers, um, those kinds of things where where triggers may happen. And this is what we try to help our clients, clients do. And this is one aspect of it. So I actually teach this to my clients. I teach them about classical conditioning. I teach them about um, acquisition and extinction. I teach them that it's a learned associative uh, learning process and that anything can be learned, can be unlearned. So very good, very, very good. Um, all right, and then there's also um, down here on the bottom, I almost forgot to mention uh, the, the concept of spontaneous recovery. Sometimes a previously extinct, extinguished conditioned response um, will, will happen following a rest period. Um, and that's known as spontaneous recovery. And 
All right. Now there's another thing in classical conditioning. Um, I said another thing, sorry, I, I keep misspeaking. There are several things on this page, right? So we have stimulus discrimination, stimulus generalization, and then habituation. Um, and these are all also important in being able to distinguish between um, stimuli. So for example, um, organisms need to be able to distinguish between different st stimuli in order to respond appropriately, right? Um, and so one aspect of that would be discrimination. And this is when an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli that are similar, right? So in other words, in this example, the dog can discriminate between a specific bell that sounds the signal foods um, and a similar bell that doesn't, right? So I'll give you an example. So I ring the bell that I've paired with my, um, with my food for my dog, but then somebody comes to the door and rings the doorbell. Now the dog is gonna to respond to the doorbell, but it's not gonna be salivating, right? Cause it, it, it's, it knows it's, that doesn't signal food. Then there's also the idea of, of stimulus generalization. And that's where an organism demonstrates the conditioned response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. Right. So if an individual uh, here, the example is if the individual dislikes a specific spider, then they will usually dislike all spiders. Right. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the um, uh, one of the homework questions talks about if grandma, you know, I love grandma's uh, chocolate chip cookies. Right. And that that causes me the smell of that causes me to salivate. Right. Um, but she's not making chocolate chip cookies today. She's making oatmeal cookies. It's a, it's a different recipe, but yet I'm still going to respond because I generalize from cookie to cookie. I hope that makes sense. And then the last part of this is classical conditioning can also lead to habituation and habituation is learning not to respond, um, to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. So as a stimulus is repeated, we learn not to focus our attention on it. So that's habituation. Kind of similar to what we were talking about in the last chapter um, uh, with our sensory adaptation, um, right? We, after a while, we just don't respond to certain stimuli. This is kind of like a similar concept, um, but it's a learning concept. All right, that was a lot. So does anybody have any questions before I move on to the next section? All right, if we do, more than happy to uh, go back and talk about it. Anybody here ever hear of Little Albert or the Little Albert study? I will tell you that today, by today's standards, the Little Albert study could not be conducted. It would be unethical to do uh, to a child what um, Watson did <laughs> to Little Albert. <coughs> so the Little Albert study was um, conducted by John, John Watson, and he used the uh, the principles of classical conditioning to actually study human emotion. And one of the things that he discovered, um, which is also something else that I use with my clients as well, is that certain emotions can be learned emotions to stimulate to certain stimulus response reactions, right? So in other words, um, you can be taught to fear something. Um, and when, when you're presented with that stimulus, you're going to experience that emotion each time you, you uh, are presented with it. And so this is what he did with little Albert. Um, and again, this video is available uh, for you guys to watch um, in the module. But what Watson did was that he exposed little Albert to certain stimuli, and then, then he conditioned them 
to, to fear them. And so what he did at first, this is what he did at first. He presented like a rabbit, a dog, um, cotton. Uh, he he um, presented a little white rat uh, and little Albert actually really liked the white rat. Um, and then what he did after, so, and he, and he saw that there was, you know, no real response, no fear response to, to the items that he presented. Um, Al, little Albert liked the little rat. He would reach out for the little rat, um, things like that. It was curious, you know, just like a regular baby would be. Well, then what they did, and this was like kind of cruel, was um, someone would be behind little Albert they would present like the little white rat and then make a loud noise. They would, they would um, hit a bell or they would hit something and make a loud noise. Now the loud noise is an unconditioned stimulus, isn't it? We're all gonna automatically react to that, right? Um, and, the, and the little white rat was kind of neutral, right? To, uh, to little Albert. But once the scary noise was paired with the white rat, after a while, just seeing the white rat without the noise, little Albert would become scared. He would cry. He would react um, uh, in a very negative way. Like he displayed negative emotions. And when I say positive versus negative, what I mean is, is, is crying, frowning, um, backing up, um, you know, reacting adversely to the stimuli. Um, so after those repeated fair, uh, uh, pairings, he became um, uh, fearful of that. So then he became fearful, and this is where stimulus generalization that we just talked about comes into play, is that once he was afraid of little white furry things, anything that was white and furry, um, he uh, was afraid of. So, uh, so that, that demonstrated stimulus generalization. So anything similar, he became afraid of. So anyone know why that it might not be ethical to do that today? Might be pretty obvious, but thought I'd throw that question out. All right, well, here's why. You know, it's unethical to induce fear into, into a child or a human being, right? It's just cruel to do that. Um, that kid is probably gonna grow up uh, hating animals. Or... Yeah, and, and so here's the other thing that's really, uh, 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 yes, there's a couple of comments too, right? Um, intentional trauma, th that, that, that is traumatic. And the other thing that you point out um, uh, also is that, think of the age. And this is another thing that I often, um, when I'm working with clients, I try to find, you know, I look through their history, I go as back, far, back as far as I can to look for clues as to what was happening back then that may be impacting their reaction um, today, right? So Albert might be afraid of, of little white rats for the rest of his life. And he's 20 years old and afraid of a white rat and maybe not even realize why he's afraid of the white rat. And it would all come back to his pre-verbal experience, right? Um, because little Albert would be pre-verbal at this point. Like he was, I think it was one at the time maybe 18 months. So um, still, I might, might be learning some words, but basically I would consider him pre-verbal, right? And so things that happen to children pre-verbal um, do have a lasting impact, but they have no memory or recollection of it, right? But yet, uh, uh, but the body remembers, the brain remembers, our reactions remember, right? So it's, um, uh, 
yeah, it's important to think about that, right? And look at those I, I, trauma experiences. Go ahead. I think it also traumatized the kid uh, as far as whoever was conducting the experiment for him not to trust anyone. Yeah, so it can have all kinds of impacts, right? Probably felt betrayed by yeah. whoever put him in that situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and 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 think about that when we're in the um, development chapter, chapter nine, um, because you're absolutely right. One of Erickson's um, earlier stages of of development is trust versus mistrust, which is the youngest stage, right? That's where babies are like, if I cry, am I going to be taken care of? Am I going to be fed? Am I going to be changed? Right? Of course, they're not thinking that way. Um, crying is their instinct. Their crying is their way of letting us know. And if no one responds, then they learn to mistrust the world very early on. Right? So. All right. A um, couple other things. You know, there's. Uh, so this was an unethical experiment. Um, and, uh, and it does show that it does have some value in that um, it does show that emotions can be classically conditioned, which I think would be important, you know, like I think it's important in my work to kind of have that idea in my mind when I'm working with a client, right? So reaction to authority um, is something that I deal with a lot. Um, and that could be from, you know, um, from a very young age as well. Um, and that's just kind of throwing out that one example. Um, and to be careful not to re-traumatize or continue that traumatizing. But the other part of this experiment, uh, backing off from the value, is that one, it was unethical. Two, some of the ways that they did things, for instance, um, if you'll notice here in this picture, right? So there's little Albert, and he's reacting to the Santa Claus. And you'll notice here um, on the bottom of the picture, it says, now he even fears Santa Claus. And when you watch the video, which I encourage you guys to do, um, you know, he puts on this mask and gets right in the kid's face. So is it really, you know, is, is it that he fears Santa Claus or are you just scaring the kid to death just because you're getting up in his face all of a sudden, right? So there's some uh, procedural issues with the experiment, um, you know, uh, yeah. So just some issues around it. Um, but the takeaway is, is that emotions can be conditioned. So um, I do want you guys to take that away from this. All right. Um, so now we're going to move into um, Skinner, who is a behaviorist, and, um, and his ideas around operant conditioning. Um, <clears throat> so there's also some terminology here. I'm going to start at the bottom and kind of point it out to you because I will talk about uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. I will talk about positive punishment. I will talk about negative punishment, right? And when it comes to positive and negative, we're not talking good or bad. So whenever you hear me, and, and, and often think about this in psychology anyway, in psychology, when we're talking about positive things, we're talking about things that are being added to a situation. When we're talking about negative, we're talking about things that are being taken away, right? So positive punishment, for example, is not good punishment. It means it's punishment. There's something being added that the individual does not like and considers punishment. Um, or negative punishment is taking something away that someone values and, and the act of taking it away, which is negative, right? Um, punishment is, um, is viewed negatively, right? And whenever we're talking about positive versus negative reinforcement versus punishment, we're talking about um, stimulus to change behavior, right? So uh, an example of negative punishment is um, if, uh, if my kid comes home and hasn't done his homework, then I take away the Xbox, right? So, so that would be like the negative punishment. I'm taking away something that he enjoys, right? Until he does his homework. So as an example. Um, so in operant conditioning, 
organisms learn to associate behavior and its consequences, right? So that's the main idea behind operant conditioning is that behavior is motivated by the consequences we receive. So if I engage in a behavior and that behavior is reinforced, right? Um, then I'm probably going to continue to engage in that behavior. If I engage in a behavior that is undesirable and that behavior is punished, then I'm likely to change that behavior so that I, I'm no longer affected by the positive or negative punishment. Um, so Skinner conducted these experiments mainly with rats. Uh, and, we'll uh, and what he used was the operant conditioning um, chamber is what it, that's the official title, the operant conditioning chamber. chamber. Um, you should be able to recognize that, but it's also AKA known as the Skinner box. Um, and he used operant conditioning um, in the Skinner box, right? In the operant conditioning chamber that contained a lever that the rat would press um, to, to dispense food as a reward. And they would react to lights and, and, uh, and, and, and sounds from the speaker, things like that. Um, and so he was able to basically train the rats um, using operant conditioning. And I have a video on that as well that, that you may uh, enjoy. All right, so I'm gonna end on this slide. Uh, so we're gonna talk about negative reinforcement and uh, positive reinforcement. And then we're gonna end, and this will conclude part one. And then on Monday, we will continue with part two. So when it comes to reinforcement, remember the word positive means I'm adding something to it, right? So something is being added to increase the likelihood of the behavior. So positive reinforcement, for example, would be high grades, right? Uh, paychecks, uh, praise. Here's an example, right? So as I was like looking through, um, uh, through, the, um, through the exam grades that have been completed so far, right? One of the things that I did at the very beginning of this, of this session was praise people on how well people were doing in the exams. Um, and I could tell by some of the feedback and reactions that I've received from the praise that that, that 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 is supportive and that that works, right? So when we praise someone for engaging in a behavior, they're more likely to increase that behavior or continue to do that behavior that, that receives, receives the praise. If I show up to work every day um, on time, um, I'm likely to get a full paycheck every two weeks, right? Um, if I'm not showing up on time, my pay is going to be docked, right? Um, and and uh, that would be the negative reinforcement, right? You know, money is being removed. <coughs> um, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's punishment. I misspoke again. Negative reinforcement is... Uh, is you remove something to increase the likelihood that the behavior will continue. So for example, um, here, um, the example of the seatbelt, right? So if you get in your car and you don't put on your seatbelt, what happens? There's that annoying ringing sound, ding, 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 ding. And to get that sound to stop, you click your seatbelt, right? So you're, you're actually, you are actually engaging in your own negative reinforcement by, by doing that. The sound is the negative reinforcement. You control the sound by engaging in the behavior. So I click the belt, that sound goes away, it stops annoying me. If I get a passenger that doesn't react too quickly to it, then I might have to say something to my passenger, right? Um, so that's positive reinforcement. Something is added to increase the likelihood. Negative reinforcement, something is removed to increase the likelihood. And I'm sorry for misspeaking before I was talking negative punishment. Um, and that just goes to show you, even with me, I deal with this all the time. It's easy to misspeak. And so when you're reading and, and it's easy to misread. So when you're doing your exam, make sure you take your time to, to carefully read the question. And, and, um, and I guarantee you, you'll, 
you'll come up with the right answer. Because I really believe you guys will know this stuff. Um, it's just sometimes we go through things too quickly. So, all right, so we're gonna end there um, for tonight. And, um, but before we do, does anybody have any last minute questions on, on uh, operant conditioning or uh, classical conditioning? And I will be reviewing some more of this stuff on Monday as well. All right, not hearing any, um, we'll go ahead and end. Uh, you all have a nice evening, uh, but don't go anywhere just yet. Um, just saying that for everyone else in YouTube land.